Hello, everyone. Uh, so glad to have you join me today. So uh, today we'll be talking about an eye on vitamin A. My name is Dr. Soumya Srinivas. I practice at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire. I have no disclosures for today's talk. So vitamin A is a uh, retinoid. It's a bad soluble retinoid uh, that is influencing all of our tissues in our body through its effects on gene transcription. So whether you're deficient in vitamin A or whether you have a toxic amount of vitamin A, it can have uh, a lot of widespread effects, which we will learn about um, today. So this was a quote that captures what vitamin A does in the body. So vitamin A or retinol is arguably the most multifunctional vitamin in the human body as it's essential from embryogenesis to adulthood. So vitamin A is the building block chromophore for rhodopsin and it's our transcription factors. So our transcription factors are proteins which are involved in the process of converting or transcribing your DNA into RNA. And transcription um, factors include a wide number of proteins, um, but these exclude RNA polymerase and they initiate and regulate the transcription of genes. So we'll begin with our first polling question today, uh, which is which of the following are physiologic roles of vitamin A? And you um, all got it correctly. So the answer, vast majority of you said all of the above, which is definitely true. So the physiologic roles of vitamin A include, you know, vision. Uh, it's involved in epithelium, uh, red blood cells, immunity, and also reproduction. So therefore all of the above um, is true. And here's what happens when you have, you know, this is a, a chart showing you what happens uh, when you are vitamin A deficiency, when you're vitamin A deficient. Um, so chronic dietary deficiency um, leads to tissue and plasma depletion, and that results in the alteration in genetic and also um, metabolic function in your body. And so this leads to systemic side effects. So it um, includes metaplasia, impaired immunity, morbidity, anemia, and poor growth. Um, and that can lead to you know, some of the ocular manifestations, which include keratomalacia, corneal ulceration, and night blindness. So of course, as you can see on the left-hand side of the um, pyramid here, uh, you can see that the mortality risk um, increases as you um, go up this pyramid. So here's our next polling question, which is which of the following is a spectrum of ocular diseases that can be caused by vitamin A deficiency? And you are correct again. So 71% of you said um, zero ophthalmia, which is the correct answer. So the ocular complications of vitamin A deficiency um, is caused by um, you know, deficiency in vitamin A, which is dry eye. You can have corneal ulceration, corneal melting, um, which is keratomalacia. Uh, there can be night blindness, which is called nyctalopia and uh, retinopathy. So these um, spectrum of ocular diseases are called, are called zero ophthalmia. So um, as you recall, vitamin A is an antioxidant and you need vitamin A for healthy functioning ocular surface. So uh, recall that um, photoreceptor rhodopsin um, is required uh, here, which is a photopigment and that is found in the rod cells of the retina. So uh, recall that um, the rhodopsin allows our eyes to see well at night. So night blindness, um, which is a 
is often the first line of vitamin A deficiency. You'll have patients um, complaining of night blindness uh, with vitamin A deficiency. So really important to remember um, that nyctalopia or night blindness is one of the symptoms. So um, ocular complications of vitamin A deficiency. Um, so here for normal histology, you have your our typical mucous membranes, which are supposed to be non-keratinized. So um, think about your cornea and your conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva is a non-keratinized squamous and columnar epithelial with mucin secreting goblet cells. Your cornea is also non-keratinized, but it's stratified uh, squamous epithelium. What happens when uh, a patient has vitamin A deficiency is uh, there is mucosal keratinization. So these um, results in ocular surface, GI and respiratory um, epithelium concerns. And so that brings us to our polling question three. What is your diagnosis of the um, pictures down below on your right hand side? And you are correct again. Um, so vast majority of you said veto spots, which is um, the correct answer here. So veto spots are, you know, if you look at the pictures there, are this subtle, you know, they're foamy, uh, they're appearing on the nasal and temporal conjunctiva, and they have been uh, linked to vitamin A deficiency. And so um, here's another picture on your left-hand side of veto spots. Uh, the other complication for vitamin A deficiency is uh, scarring of the cornea. So the middle picture shows that there's poor budding on their tear film uh, that causes uh, vitamin A deficiency. And the uh, picture on the right shows, that, shows the concept we were just talking about, which is keratinization of the ocular surface. So remember that the cornea and the conjunctiva have to be non-keratinized. So the histology um, says that non-keratinized um, surfaces are normal, but when we have keratinization uh, as a result of vitamin A deficiency, you'll have a patient like the example on the picture on your right hand side. So we talked you know, about what can happen with vitamin A deficiency. But when you have too much of vitamin A, so vitamin A excess, um, that is certainly not a good thing either. Um, and how can that happen? So, um, you know, one of the reasons vitamin A excess can happen is by diet. Um, so if you're uh, you consuming highly concentrated animal sources, such as bear, seal moose, liver, um, these, uh, the vitamin A excess is likely to happen. Uh, vitamin A excess is very unlikely with, you know, if you have a plant-based diet, um, it's exceedingly rare to have a vitamin A excess. Um, someone can also have a vitamin A excess if uh, they're, uh, you know, abusing supplements, you know, vitamin A supplementation or certain retinoid medications um, can also cause vitamin A excess. So remember that either deficiency or excess um, can have effects in the body. And so what can our toxicity or vitamin A excess do? Uh, it can lead to birth defects. Uh, it can cause bleeding. It can cause uh, shortness of breath, uh, cirrhosis. Um, it can lead to increased pressure in the brain. Um, and smokers who consume alcohol uh, and beta carotene may be at increased risk for lung cancer or heart disease. So again, these are effects uh, that may happen when uh, there is an excess of vitamin A in the body. That brings us to um, the next poll question, which is what are the sources of vitamin A? So how can you get vitamin A in your diet. All right, you're um, all correct. Uh, so both of the above, so you can get vitamin A um, via plant and animal sources, which we'll review next. 
Um, so plant includes beta-carotene, so that is a provitamin, um, and animal sources, retinal palmitate, berry, eggs, liver. Uh, so the picture on your bottom right-hand side um, shows some, you know, sources of vitamin A. Carrots, you know, certainly you've heard about uh, for vitamin A and a whole host of um, other uh, fruits and vegetables and also meat, uh, dairy, eggs, liver, and so forth are sources of uh, vitamin A. And so why does vitamin A deficiency happen? So in the United States, it's typically because of malnutrition. Um, so not getting the adequate um, doses of vitamin A that our body needs. Malabsorption, so which can typically have, happen after bariatric surgery, or just a poor vitamin metabolism. Um, and in the developing world, vitamin A deficiency is actually the leading, causes, leading cause of childhood blindness um, because of the examples we saw earlier. So that brings us um, into some of the cases we'll talk about um, with vitamin A deficiency. So the first case here was a 68-year-old um, headache, which means really weak Caucasian male. Um, and he had uh, chronic illnesses, including AML, and also history of graft versus host disease. Uh, and his popular history included herpes simplex virus with uh, central corneal ulcers, which were worse in his right eye. And so we'll go over his case next. His vision on um, the initial exam was 20 over 150 in the right eye and 20 uh, over 25 in the left eye. And his entrance testing, so his pupils, confrontation fields, and extraocular movements were unremarkable. His IOP was four milligrams of mercury in the right eye and five milligrams of mercury in the left eye. And his anterior segment exam was unremarkable, except for the significant changes that we'll see um, in the next slide. Um, so some of these significant changes include um, lag of thalmus, which was worse in his left eye compared to the right eye. He had one plus injection on the conjunctiva, which was worse in the right eye. And the cornea of the right eye showed uh, these dense sort of central punctate epithelial keratitis. Uh, and there was also that inferior central epithelial defect and also a uh, faint infiltrate. So he only had about 30% um, of the stroma remaining. In his uh, left eye, there was an intra intracentral epithelial defect uh, with uh, punctate stain. So the picture on the screen is a picture um, of his uh, right eye with that dense um, keratitis and also that uh, epithelial defect, which you can see on the, um, in the picture below. Um, and corneal sensation was uh, performed. So it was, he essentially had no sensation in his cornea and the right eye, a little bit one over four sensation uh, in his left eye. So there was no um, AC reaction and there was no corneal perforation. Um, and his dilated fundus exam was unremarkable. And so here you can see uh, a baseline uh, photograph of how this uh, patient presented with the epithelial defect. And so, um, when we examined this patient, we thought of a few different uh, differential diagnoses for this patient. So um, the first on our list was severe dry eye. Uh, the second one was uh, nutritional keratopathy. And uh, recall that he had a history of rheumatoid arthritis. So, um, so because of that, we had to consider um, autoimmune milk. We had to consider HSV keratitis, um, either a bacterial or a fungal infection on his cornea. And so we ordered vitamin A levels. And so the reference for vitamin A is supposed to be um, normal is between 32.5 to 78. And this patient's initial vitamin A level was 16. So you can imagine that um, it's extremely low, um, you know, making him vitamin A deficient. 
And because of this, um, you know, based on our differentials and what we got for vitamin A, we thought that, you know, the um, changes on dyscornia or keratopathy was thought to be because of vitamin A deficiency, given his um, medical and ocular history. Uh, so recall that he had no sensation of um, the cornea in his right eye. Uh, so we diagnosed this as a neurotrophic keratopathy, and he had that central corneal ulcer, um, and also that thinning you saw in the picture due to the, due to the vitamin A deficiency. And so the next steps um, for treating and managing this patient were um, corneal cultures were taken and we had placed a bandage contact lens and replaced it daily when we saw him for follow-up. And um, we also did a lateral tarsography um, in the right eye. Uh, Vigamox was uh, prescribed for him our two hours in the right eye, alternated with artificial tears. Every two hours in both eyes were also prescribed. And this patient showed continued improvement in the right eye with healing of the epithelium and certainly uh, improvement in the vision. So based on this, um, what other treatment would you um, advise for this patient? So in addition to the Vigamox and you know, tarsography, um, what else would you recommend uh, for this patient? And so that is absolutely right. So a good majority of you said vitamin A supplements, um, which is exactly um, what this patient uh, was recommended as the next step. Um, so this was certainly beneficial in the patient's recovery process. Um, and uh, upon giving him vitamin A su um, supplements, recall that his baseline vitamin A level was 16 and it actually improved to 36 uh, with these supplements. So he certainly continued this nutritional support um, per his dietitian's recommendations. Um, and here's a follow-up image. Um, so the keratopathy, uh, as you recall in this case, was due to the severe vitamin A deficiency. Um, and the picture here shows a remarkable improvement um, as vitamin A supplementation and other um, measures uh, were uh, used to treat this patient. So there's uh, a marked improvement in his uh, cornea as seen in the picture here. Uh, and just a before and after picture here, um, comparing their uh, patient's initial uh, uh, follow initial uh, exam versus follow up exam. So to case number two. Um, so this is a 47 year old uh, Caucasian female with uh, chronic kidney disease, and she was treated with um, dialysis for her. Uh, uh, CKD, and she also had a short bowel uh, and gut syndrome, and also a history of nutritional deficiency. Um, she lived in Nevada, but had been visiting the area with, um, you know, due to her son who was ill, and she was the primary driver and reported that she was unable to drive safely uh, because of the uh, significant decline in her vision. Um, and her past ocular history included. Um, dry eye for which she was on restasis, but she actually reported that um, restasis was um, pretty much unresponsive um, to her blurry vision and all of her dry eye symptoms. So in other words, uh, the restasis that she had been uh, prescribed um, was not really helping with any of her symptoms. And so uh, vision on the baseline uh, exam without glasses was 2030 in the right eye uh, and 2100 in the left eye. Her pupils, extraocular muscles, uh, confrontation fields were all normal and her eye pressures were 18 in both eyes. And her ocular findings included um, anterior segment, which was unremarkable except for significant conch and corneal findings, um, as we'll talk about below. So the conjunctiva had um, keratinization uh, in both eyes. So uh, left eye worse than the right eye. Uh, and then the cornea um, also showed mild punctate epithelial keratitis uh, with that central cloudy um, sort of dystrophy. And in the left eye, um, 
she had severe pantain, um, epithelial keratitis, and it was a, a swirling pattern with a central um, cloudy dystrophy, which I'll show you in a picture um, coming up next. And there was no butarda in each eye. And then the um, dilated fundus examination was unremarkable in both eyes. So we also ordered vitamin A levels um, for this patient because we thought, you know, she could be vitamin A deficient um, due to her medical and um, eye history. Uh, and certainly it did come back, um, you know, as a 6.4, we call that the reference. The normal is between 32 to 78. So she was uh, pretty severely vitamin A uh, deficient. Um, and we couldn't get the follow-up vitamin A as she um, moved back to Nevada, uh, but I do have her um, baseline of follow-up photos for this patient. And a few other things we did for this patient was um, we um, put her on uh, punctal plugs uh, uh, and also referred her to nephrology, uh, gastroenterology, and also nutritional services. Um, and she was started on vitamin, vitamin A um, supplements. So um, adults, uh, for adults, vitamin A are 200,000 units, um, 60,000 MCG. So she was on it once daily for two days uh, and then repeat with a single dose after two weeks. And this is for the um, World Health Organization um, uh, recommendations, uh, which was prescribed for her in this case. And so this patient was to follow up in New Hampshire. She prolonged her stay, um, but we did refer her to a primary care doctor in Nevada, um, who she had a follow up with um, a month after um, her return uh, to Nevada. And based on the one follow up exam that we had, um, her symptoms had improved significantly. So recall that um, the vision in the um, left eye was 2100, uh, and with vitamin A supplementation and punctal plugs and the other measures, her vision uh, markedly improved to 2030 in that left eye. Um, and so the punctate epithelial keratitis on the cornea had also improved, uh, and this corresponds to the uh, improvement in her vision in both of her eyes. Um, and so these, uh, the first set of photos here are her visit um, at baseline. So these are just her initial visit. And as you can see, you can um, maybe a little uh, tough depending on lighting, but a lot of um, our dryness going on on the cornea, a lot of SDK. Uh, and here's just her follow visit, um, which looked a lot better uh, given her, um, you know, vitamin A supplementation and others, uh, other measures, including plugs and um, drops used for dry eye. And then our final case for vitamin A deficiency is a 42-year-old. Um, he's a Caucasian um, male, obese, or excuse me, female, uh, deaf, obese, history of alcohol use, um, and a severe multi-system disease, including nutritional deficiency, multiple sclerosis, anemia, sepsis, and liver failure. Um, so the chief complaint for this um, patient was her eyes became very inflamed um, and suddenly within a few days. And so this patient was actually seen as an inpatient. Um, and so we have uh, the slip lamp findings here with the corneal epithelial defect uh, with the corneal perforation in this case um, with an iris plug. She had a very shallow but a formed anterior uh, chamber. Her side L was negative. Um, and we could see that, you know, on her corneal stroma, thinning was pretty evident um, in her right eye. In her left eye, she had um, intact but a loose epithelium with an area of severe thinning, which was likely a dust pedocele. Um, in this uh, eye, the sidel was also negative, but with a deeper anterior chamber. And so we did have a clear view of the posterior pole and no pathology was observed. So there was no choroidal pathology or vasculitis or retinitis or choroiditis um, appreciated in her um, eyes. 
So uh, we decided to glue both of our eyes given the corneal perforation and the rapidly progressive thinning over the course of you know, uh, a very short duration. Um, and so she had you know, glued bilateral staph aureus corneal ulcers, um, which was actually due to vitamin A deficiency. And we also um, got some cultures of so bilateral MSSA corneal ulcer. Uh, in the right eye, her cornea was perforated, and in the left eye, uh, her cornea was uh, showed severe thinning. Um, and because of this, the cornea was glued in both eyes. Um, the right eye glue was pretty stable and the AC was formed, um, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, in her left eye, which was pretty thin, uh, the cornea actually ended up perforating sort of around the glue um, on the following day. Uh, so then we thought her rapid bilateral corneal ulcer, maybe uh, because of her severe nutritional deficiency, particularly vitamin A. So we ended up ordering the vitamin A uh, level for this patient. And initially um, we thought, you know, the rapid corneal ulcer and melting the keratomalacia, uh, which is common as we discussed in vitamin A, was unclear, but likely multifactorial. So recall that this patient was actually obese, but despite her obesity, she may have had micronutrient uh, deficiencies. So vitamin C was also low, uh, zinc was low, low vitamin uh, D. Um, and she also um, had mucositis, and there was also a presence of um, lag of pelvis. So the ulcer was present in the region of her lag of pelvis. And she had also been infected with um, MSSA, um, but there was no current active uh, infection. And so we got some repeat corneal cultures, um, which were negative in the left eye, but it came back positive for mixed um, GP organisms in her right eye. And uh, the treatment for this patient was um, subconjunctival vancomycin, uh, twice in, a, in that eye was obtained since that culture, and she uh, remained on Vigamox every three hours. And fortunately, there was no progression to endophthalmitis for this patient. And here's um, a figure um, with not the perforation, but just severe thinning um, in her left eye, which is seen in the picture here. Um, so again, recall that you know um, zero ophthalmia is a spectrum of ocular diseases that can be caused by vitamin A deficiency. Uh, the signs include dry eye corneal ulceration, melting or keratomalacia, which we saw um, in our last case, night blindness, nyctalopia, and also retinopathy. And so the next question for you is we learned about um, some of the causes or ocular signs of vitamin A deficiency, um, but do you think, here's our poll question six, does vitamin A affect myopic progression? All right, so um, a few different responses here. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. And that question was actually studied um, in this paper, which we'll go over next. All right, so could there be other associations for vitamin A deficiency? Uh, so in other words, you know, if someone had vitamin A deficiency, could it lead to the progression of um, myopia? Um, and, you know, think about, you know, sort of what we do for myopia. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, could optical correction certainly, um, you know, sun protection, laser correction, you know, vitamins, exercises, and so all of these things uh, were looked at. And so the study, which actually came out um, in 2020, they actually look at, um, you know, is dietary vitamin A uh, associated with myopia from adolescence to young adulthood. And the reason um, why they, you know, um, looked at this was because of, you know, as you may um, know, there's a huge myopia um, epidemic around the world. 
Um, so as you know, you know, progression of myopia can cause, you know, things like cordial neovascularization, retinal detachment, especially with the rapid progression that we're seeing um, in a lot of our children nowadays. Uh, so this was published in Translational Vision, Science and uh, Technology in a recent Australian study. And it actually found no evidence that young adults with low vitamin A are likely to become myopic by the age 20. So even though it's not a linear relationship, there may be sort of a threshold for optimal vitamin A intake and axial elongation. Um, this evidence, you know, certainly, you know, they looked at this because of the um, myopic, um, myopia epidemic globally. Um, and so they were looking into whether vitamin A, um, you know, prevents myopic progression or helps um, slow it down. But unfortunately, it doesn't um, appear to stem myopia progression in um, young youth, in youth. And so, um, you know, again, the question was, is vitamin A, you know, uh, beneficial for preventing myopic progression? And so based on that study there, concluded that vitamin A is certainly beneficial for the eyes, um, like we just saw, um, but just not for preventing myopia. So this study showed that, you know, it can certainly help with other things, um, but you cannot prevent myopia um, with vitamin A. And certainly in cases of, you know, certain types of keratopathy um, in susceptible patients or patients who have, um, you know, certain types of diseases or weak um, AML, which we saw, um, you know, it's important to assess vitamin A levels uh, just because, you know, as we saw in the case, you know, three cases, vitamin A um, supplementation really um, also helped improve ocular signs and symptoms. Um, so really important to keep that as one of your differential diagnoses um, when you're looking at what may be um, you know, contributing to the patient's ocular signs and symptoms. So if you see someone with um, significant dry eye that's, you know, showing no improvement, like we saw in our second case, you know, she, um, you know, was on a lot of dry eye therapy, restasis, none of which was helping. Um, you know, I wouldn't say maybe get vitamin A in all your patients with dry eye, uh, but certainly consider their systemic uh, history as well. Um, just to see if this would be one of the um, things to consider um, it, with regards to treating your patient. Um, and so conclusion, uh, ocular signs of dry eye or xerosis are due to vitamin A deficiency. Uh, and recall that xeropthalmia is a spectrum of ocular diseases um, that can be caused by vitamin A deficiency. So again, recall it includes um, dry eye, corneal ulceration, corneal melting, keratomalacia, night blindness, nyctalopia, and also retinopathy. Uh, but certainly keep in mind as far as myopic progression, you know, vitamin A can certainly help in, you know, um, these ocular manifestations for just not to slow down uh, the progression of myopia. So that uh, concludes my talk. I uh, really appreciate you all, you know, attending and joining in, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, you may have. Thank you. So how long is a vitamin A um, supplementation? What is their dose of vitamin A? So we just followed um, sort of World Health Organization um, sort of recommendations for uh, prescribing vitamin A. As far as, you know, how uh, their duration of vitamin A, um, it really depends on, you know, what their levels are. So I would recommend, you know, just getting a follow-up vitamin A level um, on the patients. Um, and certainly if it's back to the normal, um, you know, uh, uh, levels, uh, then you can certainly cut back on the dosage, but also keep in mind, you know, the conditions that the patient is diagnosed with. Sometimes they may have to be on uh, vitamin A supplementation long term, uh, but also certainly keeping in mind that we don't want to overdo it because, um, you know, we don't want to cause uh, vitamin A uh, toxicity either. So that was with regards to dosing. Um, 
So how long do you expect? Um, it, again, it really depends on you know the patient and what they have um, as far as their underlying reason for the vitamin A deficiency. Um, and as far as the interval testing, um, uh, again, you know, just it's a case by case basis. So uh, looking at, you know, their um, systemic history as well, and certainly working with your, you know, the um, patient's nutritionist and um, pretty much their whole team, um, just to decide interval and repeating vitamin A testing, um, as far as when do we expect um, the vitamin levels to um, increase after supplementation. Um, so treatment protocol for vitamin A deficiency, again, um, considering supplements uh, for sure, you know, measuring the levels of vitamin A, um, again, based on World Health Organization recommendations um, and making sure that we're monitoring that closely with their um, whole team of doctors, just because it's important, you know, as an eye specialist, we have to work with our team to see um, how long the patient is going to be on vitamin A and, you know, the proper dose and whatnot. So I would say work with the, um, the our team of doctors to kind of get that guidance um, as far as how long the patient needs to be on it. Um, so vitamin A, um, I don't, I, maybe high levels are contraindicated in dry AMD. Um, you have to be, you know, um, careful about, you know, smokers, history of smoking and, you know, excessive vitamin A. And um, so certainly some of the um, dry AMD medications also have some, you know, dose of vitamin A, um, but I don't think vitamin A is uh, contraindicated in dry AMD. Um, I don't think, you know, I think you would need a vitamin um, A, you know, oral supplement versus, you know, like our topical supplement. Um, supplement. So as far as treating your um, you know, patient holistically, um, you would certainly recommend drops and you know, um, plugs, um, things like restasis or you know, other um, medications, cyclosporins for dry eye. Um, but I, I believe, I don't know about a topical vitamin A treatment that would you know, uh, resolve the issue because it is an um, underlying vitamin A deficiency. So you may need oral medications um, in patients with, you know, vitamin A deficiency. Uh, so I don't know of any difference in the oral versus um, paraenteral uh, prescriptions. You know, certainly for these um, three patients, we considered the oral supplementation. Um, but again, it may depend on each case to see if, you know, they, um, if it can be given, you know, in other um, ways as far as, you know, supplement, uh, supplementing with vitamin A. Uh, so what do we have to monitor in patients on vitamin A supplementation? Um, so certainly getting their uh, vitamin A levels is um, important, but also treating their ocular signs and symptoms. So, um, you know, again, uh, if there is an infection, you know, antibiotics, um, or if it's just severe dry eye, like we saw in one of the cases, um, you know, maximizing their dry eye treatment um, would be what you know, is to be monitored on um, patients who have been supplemented with vitamin A. So making sure that their ocular signs and symptoms are improving as well. So why was IOP so low in um, case one? You know, certainly I don't think it's related to the vitamin A deficiency. Um, but certainly, you know, that is something, um, you know, that uh, struck us as well, um, as far as why the IOP was um, pretty low in case one. So medical consultations with, um, with patients with vitamin A deficiency, um, again, working with their team of doctors, because you certainly need a nutritionist on board, um, you need the patient's primary care doctor, uh, depending on, you know, whether they have uh, kidney disease, nephrology. Uh, so really working with their team of doctors um, is advised for as far as medical consultations for any patient with um, vitamin A deficiency.
as far as how long um, we should supplement with vitamin A. Um, again, it depends on each case. Um, so working with their team of doctors and making sure that you're obtaining vitamin A levels uh, per their recommendations to make sure that um, they're not deficient in vitamin A. So certainly if it comes to the normal levels, uh, working with them to see if you can reduce the supplementation or um, you know, if there's an underlying medical condition for which they have to be on vitamin A supplementation, um, working with their team to see, you know, how long we should be supplementing the patient with vitamin A. Uh, so that's a good question about, you know, xerophthalmia and, you know, sort of fundus. Uh, so the cases I presented today didn't actually have um, you know, any retinopathy or, you know, um, uh, issues going on in the uh, back surface of the eye. Uh, but certainly that's something to keep a watch for because um, vitamin A deficiency can not only um, affect anterior segment, but also certainly posterior segment. So that's a good question. Um, I don't have an example uh, because these patients um, front this look normal. Um, so there's no, uh, you know, I don't have a, um, a picture of the fundus for these patients. So that's a good question as well, as far as how common is retinopathy due to vitamin A. Um, so again, the cases we saw mostly involve, you know, the um, keratopathy and anterior segment, uh, but certainly with vitamin A deficiency, it is common. Um, and, you know, we essentially have to do a good uh, dilated fundus exam um, just to see if it's, you know, if the patient um, is affected, you know, both anterior and posterior segments or just posterior segment or versus anterior segment only. Uh, does vitamin A deficiency cause retinal displacement? Um, not that I know of just retinopathy, uh, but not retinal. Um, displacement. Uh, how frequently fundus examination should be done? Um, so fundus exam um, should be done certainly based on, you know, on the initial exam because we want to make sure that there are no posterior manifestations of vitamin A deficiency. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, depending on, you know, other concerns, maybe repeating a dilated fundus exam based on, again, um, each case. Would you recommend routine vitamin A supplementation for patient with ulcerative keratitis where vitamin A uh, levels is not readily available? Um, unlikely because you certainly, you know, do not want to have an excess of vitamin A either. So vitamin A supplementation provides, um, you know, certainly very high doses of vitamin A. So if, um, I'm not sure, you know, if, um, I would just give vi routine vitamin A supplementation. Um, if you cannot test their levels of vitamin A. Um, as far as vitamin A slowing down the progression of um, retinitis pigmentosa, um, again, I'm not sure, you know, how, um, as far as the supplement that we need to give, you know, to slow down the progression, but it can, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, you would work with your, um, retina specialist and also um, their primary care team um, to see if you know, uh, it can be given for retinitis pigmentosa. Vitamin A role in the imp improvement of eyesight, you know, certainly if they're vitamin A deficient and um, you know, have dry eye or other concerns from vitamin A, um, there is a, you know, vitamin A can reduce vision because of the, um, the keratopathy it causes. Um, so it can certainly improve eyesight, you know, especially, you know, if the etiology of um, the patient is a vitamin A deficiency. Um, so whether the patient had low IOP from vitamin A deficiency, um, unlikely that's not one of the known causes of vitamin A deficiency. So I don't know. I think it may have been, um, you know, something else, but I don't think the vitamin A deficiency 
cause the um, low IOP in that patient. So does vitamin A improve eyesight um, as a whole and in dry eye? You know, certainly the vitamin A, um, you know, if their ocular surface is treated for, if they're vitamin A uh, deficient, you know, providing supplementation can certainly help improve eyesight um, and also uh, help improve their signs and symptoms of dry eye. So which group of pregnant mothers should get vitamin A supplementation? Um, so certainly vitamin A is important as you saw in embryogenesis, uh, but as far as excess, you know, vitamin A supplement, so that can also cause birth defects. So I would really be cautious about, you know, pregnant mothers getting vitamin A, um, you know, unless of course they're deficient, you can certainly supplement them with vitamin A. Um, but if, you know, their levels are normal, I don't, I wouldn't recommend any vitamin A supplements because Recall that even you know higher levels of vitamin A uh, can cause uh, birth defects and other problems. As far as link between measles and vitamin A deficiency, um, I am not too sure about that one. Um, I don't know if um, there's a link between measles and vitamin A deficiency. When will you stop using vitamin A? Um, again, depends on each case. So. Um, if their levels are back up to normal, um, you know, it's, um, you would consult with a nutritionist and other members of the medical team um, to see if you would give just a lower dose or, you know, if it's okay just to stop the vitamin A supplementation. Uh, so just to summarize, what is the safe dose of vitamin A to take on a daily basis? Um, so again, I don't know if uh, patients who don't have a deficiency need to take extra vitamin A on a daily basis. Um, so certainly checking the levels um, of vitamin A if you suspect a deficiency can help. Um, but I don't um, recommend you know just taking supplement on a, a routine basis if there's not a deficiency in vitamin A. Um, so I believe we answered that question. How long do you live, give the supplementation? Uh, again, working with you know their team of doctors um, and nutritionists, um, and certainly measuring their levels um, should be uh, evaluated in terms of um, how long to give uh, the vitamin A. Uh, so any difference between vitamin A derivatives? Um, again, recall that you know they're plant and animal sources for vitamin A. Um, so with animal sources, you're like much likely um, to get our toxicity in vitamin A versus um, with the plant uh, compared with the plant-based diet. Um, so we can get moxifloxacin at the half price of Vigamox. Um, so again, it depends as far as the you know, ocular surface what you're treating them for. Um, so you know they're both um, you know good medications, but it depends on you know what you see on their cornea as far as whether to use um, moxifloxacin or Vigamox. Um, again, how long do you need to supplement vitamin A before switching to dietary? Um, all depends on their vitamin um, A levels. Uh, and also, you know, depends on their underlying systemic health. Um, so their underlying systemic um, health determines that they would be, you know, chronically deficient in vitamin A. You probably um, need to supplement, you know, before switching to, um, you know, instead of a dietary uh, vitamin A supplement. Um, so again, it depends on each case for that. Um, so I'm not sure what, uh, why did we suspect a vitamin A deficiency in this patient? So I'm not sure which case you're talking about, um, but in all three cases, um, the patients you know, had underlying systemic um, health issues. Um, 
you know, they were pretty weak and thin AML um, and chronic kidney disease and other conditions, nutritional deficiencies, which is why we suspected a vitamin A deficiency in actually all of the three cases. Uh, oral supplementation enough if the patient has uh, small intestine removed. Um, again, I would recommend working with you know the patient's medical team to determine you know if the oral supplementation is enough or you know if they would need uh, other measures um, just to keep their vitamin A levels in check. What is the rule of uh, vitamin A? I ointment for dryness. Um, so again, for my routine dry eye and blepharitis patients, I would not recommend you know vitamin A supplementation. But certainly, you know, if I'm concerned about um, you know uh, they have underlying chronic um, systemic issues, that would alert me um, to the reason for dryness and blepharitis because of vitamin A deficiency. Then I would certainly get vitamin A levels, but I wouldn't get it for you know all of my dry eye patients. And if a child has severe malnutrition with vitamin A deficiency, uh, what is their dose and how many days? Um, so again, working with their medical team, you know, certainly helps. Um, it depends on how deficient they are and how, um, you know, what their systemic health includes to see uh, the dosage and how many days they're going to be on um, vitamin A. What objective measures to use? Um, to evaluate positive vitamin A, um, you know, again, vitamin A level, um, you know, getting a lab blood work on a vitamin A level would be the best way, you know, the best objective measure um, to see if they have, you know, supplementation sort of is improving or whether they have a supplementation failure. So I thank you all again for attending. Um, and thank you, Orbis, for giving me the, the opportunity to speak today.